Around the world, people are crying out, help, we need help. You watch the news, you listen to what's happening around the world, it's just devastating. But it's not just around the world, there are people crying out here in the United States, uh, in Virginia, in Lynchburg. Some do it loudly, some do it silently and suffer. But people are crying out, I need help. Where is the hope? Where is the grace? Whether it's at E.C. Glass High School or it's the neighbor across the street, where is the hope of the gospel being presented? People are crying out for the government's help, and certainly the government has more resources than the average human being or local church. But something that's far greater than anything the government will ever provide is a direct access to the true and holy almighty God who we can access through prayer, we can access through reading of the Word, where we can provide somebody a life transformation that is far greater than just the immediate help of the moment. That we ought to be far more uh, involved in our world through prayer and the communication of the gospel because that's the tools that we have that really make a difference. There is a world that is starving for grace for hope and for help. And the church is silent in too many places. We can become critical. We can become uh, uh, just abandoning, abandoning the situation. But we ought to be, as the church, a voice of clarity, a voice of compassion, and certainly a voice that communicates the living Christ who lived, died, and rose again for people that live in this world that just do not know it. We're in the book of Titus. We've been walking through the summer, verse by verse, through the book of Titus. And today we're going to enter into chapter 3. And so I'm going to invite you to turn to chapter 3 uh, in your Bible, in Titus. It's a small little book, only three chapters, 46 verses. And in this small book, as we uh, enter into chapter 3, I'm going to, by the, the God's grace, perhaps I'll finish chapter 3 next week. But the focus here is reaching a grace-starved people in this world. Let me mention, if you don't have a Bible with you and, and you don't find one on your phone, pick up the black Bible in the pew rack right in front of you. And you can turn to page 938. It'll get you right to where you need to be. One of the major themes in Titus, among several themes, is the equipping the church for effective evangelism. And how is the church, as they're established... And discipling one another, going to interact with the world that surrounds them. How we live, how we love, and how we lead matters in this world. Otherwise, God would have just saved us and took us to heaven immediately. He left us here so that we might communicate that same grace, that same love, that same compassion that has been extended to us. Oh, how I first saw the light. Didn't we just sing that? There are people still in darkness that have not seen the light. Who's going to bring them the light? We assume somebody else, maybe an organization, maybe a, a megachurch, maybe you know, somebody on television. But do you realize that you may be the very instrument, the very human being that God has ordained to bring the light to someone in your sphere of influence that nobody else has access to like you do? They may be in your home. They may be in your dorm or down the hall. They may be a neighbor down the street or they may be a co-worker. How you live your life, how you love them uh, when you interact with them, and how you lead them to Christ makes all the difference. Consider this year that you might just be a missionary bringing hope, not around the world, but right in your world, to make a difference for someone who is so much starving for the grace of Christ and just doesn't know it yet. Do you remember the first time you heard the gospel? Do you remember what was included in that presentation? Did you hear about the forgiveness of Jesus for your life? That he would forgive you of all of your sins? Did you hear about the hope of heaven when that gospel presentation was given to you? That if you'll pray this prayer, not only will you be forgiven, but you'll have a home in heaven. How many of you heard something of that nature? A few of you? Anybody? Yes, this is interactive. It's all right. 
Did you hear about anything beyond just forgiveness of your sins of the past and the future heaven that's promised to you? Was there anything about this life presented to you in the gospel presentation? I believe sometimes when we share the gospel, we, we, we want to take care of that which is holding us down now, and we want something for the future, but there's a void in the gospel presentation about what happens now. What is God going to do with me from the point of, of receiving Christ and the forgiveness and when he glorifies my life in heaven? What happens in the now? How am I going to make it today, tomorrow, the next day? And what is my role as a follower of Christ in the world that I live in until I get to heaven and see him face to face? We were not just saved from something, sin and hell. We were saved to something and not just heaven. We were saved to be a follower that is used by God's grace to reach other people. He gifts us to be able to do so. I mean, think about what Jesus said when he was first calling people to himself. He said, follow me in Matthew chapter 4. Follow me. I will then make you, this transformation, fishers of men. He didn't say, follow me. I'll promise heaven for the future. That was the reality, yes. But he says, I've got something for you right now. Follow me. I'll begin to reshape you into my image. And then I'm going to send you out to take that very message I'm giving you to give to someone else. Too often we think that's the extra credit class. That's for the advanced Christians. If you know anything about those he was calling in these days... Fishermen, tax collectors, they weren't the elite. They didn't make it through the rabbinic school. They hadn't got to memorize everything of the Old Testament. They, they, they failed out before they were allowed to, to, to advance. And so Jesus went to those who, who didn't have it all together. He called them and says, you know, I'm going to make you. And you're going to be my spokespeople. You're going to be my messengers. You're going to be the change agents that I use. The most unlikely individuals. But he used them in a powerful way. And we sometimes elevate these early disciples like they were superheroes. When really they were just the guys, the gals, and the community. And as Titus uh, you know, is learning this from Paul, he's learning, okay, we've got to shape the church in chapter 1. We've got to have some elders in place. We've got to have some structure. In chapter 2, there's got to be some discipleship structure where older and younger are interacting with one another, another that they're encouraging, edifying one another. But it's not just an in-house type environment. The church is to now go outward. And what are they going to do with that message that they've received? The world's desperate to hear it. They weren't calling in uh, the Navy SEALs of Christianity to do the work. They were calling the regular church members who just love God to interact with those that God has placed in their life to share the message that will change the world. You know, salvation is not by what we do. But salvation does something in us. And it does something through us when we truly know Jesus. Do you agree? That it doesn't just come to us. The salvation message comes through us. I read Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 where it says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. This salvation is a gift of God. We didn't earn it. And he goes on and says, see, this is not a result of your works, so that nobody can boast. But, and we memorize that, even in Awanas, that Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, 9 are so essential. But I wish they would tag on verse 10, because it's all in one context. What's verse 10 say? It says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You're not saved by your works, you're saved by the works of Christ. And when he saves you, then he gives you works to do and enables you to accomplish it. And part of that work is, what are you going to do with what's been given to you? You've been given a grace message, you've been given salvation, so what are you going to do with it? Hold it back and, and silent, be, be in silence and just be thankful for it? Or are you going to express that out? When something is good, you tell people about it. I don't know if you do this. I'm a, a little nerdy about it. But I love to go to different restaurants and, and eating establishments. And I love to review them on Google. Anybody else do that? 
It started when I got such bad service, I said, I'm going to write about this publicly. Now, that's kind of a, a negative way to do that, but I did that. But then I thought, you know what, you want to praise people when they're doing a good job. So I do that all the time. And so I've got over 4 million people who've seen my, my stuff on Google, which is just really weird to me. You take a picture and everybody wants to see it, whatever. But, you know, when, when somebody's doing a great job, I want people to know about it. Well, how in the world do we know about the greatest God who created us and we don't tell anybody about it? We'll post about every kind of thing. We'll talk about all kinds of stuff, you know, a football game or, or, or a restaurant. But what about Jesus who, who could change someone's life? Do you bring that message to those people that need to hear it? Even in uncomfortable situations. Some of you go back for family reunions or you connect with, you know, with people who in your family would prefer not to hear it. Do you live loud, the gospel, even with them? Not in an obnoxious way, but just this is who you are. You don't have to hide it. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to leave those fill in the blanks for you to fill in. You get your prep for school tomorrow. Listen, when Jesus came, he came to die for us to provide salvation. When he left, he sent the Holy Spirit so that we may be transformed and sanctified in order to be a mouthpiece for the gospel. What good is it, my brothers, James tells us, if someone says they have faith but has no works, can that say, faith actually save him? He goes on and says, so also faith by itself, if it doesn't have anything outwardly, no works that show evidence of that, that faith is dead. I'd even go as far to say as salvation, you say, I'm saved. Salvation without transformation is truly damnation because you're fooling yourself if there's no work that works out that God is doing in. We live in a culture that certainly is hostile to the gospel and is corrupted by the moral sin that is so prevalent. This was true in Paul's day. So what does Paul tell those in Crete? You're going to live out the gospel. Today, in a short way, I'm going to just unpack the first eight verses about, and I'm going to just key off of a song we just sang, Remember. Because he uses the term here uh, in verse 1, if you look at it, to remind them. Remind them. This is what we are about. This is what we're going to do. Remind them. They've heard the gospel, so remind them of how they're going to live in the world that I've placed them. Whether God has placed this in Crete, or he's placed this in Lynchburg, or wherever we are. We bloom where we're planted. We proclaim the gospel wherever we go. So he's, I'm going to show you four key uh, things in this passage about remembering. The first one is this. If you're a believer in Christ, you're connected to the local body uh, of the church, then you need to remember who you are. Remember who we are as we're in the world. Don't forget, don't have a Sunday person that you are and a Monday person that you are, as if you're just a chameleon changing your stripes based on the crowd you're with. He says, you've got to be a genuine, authentic believer, so remember who we are. And he starts here with, with how we're going to interact with our own rulers or the government that we're with. We submit obediently. Look at these words. Remind them to be submissive to the rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. He starts with being submitted obediently. When they step out the, of the walls of the church, they're under the, the Roman rule or whoever is controlling at that moment. And so you have to follow the laws that are there. Your role as a believer is not to be the rebel to change the entire culture. If you recall when Jesus was walking the planet, he came down and the whole goal of the Jewish people, if he was going to be their leader, was could you overthrow the Roman government for that is, will be our victory will finally be who we need to be if you'll just abolish the, the, the Roman government. And Christ disappointed many because that was not his, his role. That was not his goal in his first coming, was to abolish or overthrow the government. He really wanted to abolish sin and overthrow your connection to it. He wanted to save you. For it was a heart issue, it was an internal issue, not an external government issue. And here, you know, Jesus told, told them as they questioned about how his interaction with the government, Jesus said in Matthew 22, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. 
You know, be submissive to the ruler's authorities to be obedient. Paul extended the thought in Romans 13, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. Those that exist have been instituted by God. He was speaking to the Romans under a Roman rule. Uh, speaking to those in Rome who had Nero as their ruler. You know, this is a, the place where, where they, people say, well, we don't like the way they're, they're persecuting us as believers. He's saying, where you're able to just surrender to that rule. And I'll give more clarification in a minute. Peter also spoke about this in 1 Peter 2. Be subject for the Lord's sake. To every human institution, whether it be an emperor as supreme or to the governors as such, by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. So, what is your position, how you interact with the government as a believer? There's different views in this, in this body right now. But I want to know here, this is what I think Paul's driving for, for right here in, in this particular passage. Are we known more for our love for the government or even our, our criticism of the government? Or are we more, uh, known more for our passion for God? We may have a thought about the government, either positive or negative, but is that what we proclaim more than the gospel of Jesus who actually controls the universe? Christians are not anarchists. We obey the laws unless it violates our conscience according to God's commands. For in Acts chapter 5, when the, Peter and the disciples were being captured and told not to speak about God, he, he clearly says, we must obey God rather than man. So you find two places, or several places in Scripture, but two thoughts. Obey the governing authorities. And obey God rather than man. So how do you reconcile the two? It depends on who your greatest authority is. Who is your highest authority? All right, when you were growing up and you were a child, did your parents ever leave you with a babysitter? Maybe babysitter was grandma or an aunt. Perhaps it's the teenage girl that was down the street. Everybody probably had some time where their parent had to be away, and they, 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 they surrendered their time with you to someone else. All right, imagine that you were, let's say you're eight years old, and, and the babysitter's there, and, and uh, the parent has given instructions and all, and then with this, this uh, time, the, uh, let's say it's a 15-year-old a teenage babysitter, right? And uh, that teenager's going to be on the phone, or they're going to watch Netflix, and they say, hey, why don't we watch this show, you know, that maybe your mom or dad wouldn't let you watch. And the, and the kid has to think, oh, yeah, this might be kind of fun. And the, and the babysitters are been told to get the child into bed by like nine o'clock, and hey, and they're not supposed to have ice cream or caffeine, you know, after like eight. And the teenager goes, let's just watch the show. Your mom's not going to be home till like 11. Let's stay up. Let's watch the show that you're not supposed to. Let's eat ice cream and drink Pepsi or Mountain Dew. Yeah, Mountain Dew. That'd even be better. Jolt Cola or something like that. Yeah, let's just get something. that This will be so much fun. And, and what's that kid going to do? They're going to go, this is the greatest babysitter ever. Or they're going to go, oh my goodness, if my mom finds out, I'm going to get a whooping. You're in that contrast right there. You have to decide what you're going to do. Because why? The babysitter is the authority at that moment. But you know there's a higher authority that has a different expectation. If the governing authority isn't aligned with what you know is right by the higher authority, you must obey it. When that governing authority steps outside the bounds of what God has ordained and what you know is right, then you have absolute authority to disobey that. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? But you better be very clear on knowing if it's just your will or God's will that you disobey. Because some Christians go, I am, you know, a sovereign citizen. I don't have to pay taxes. I don't have to do this. I don't have to do that because I just do what I want to do. And I'll just claim God gave me that permission. And that's not true according to Scripture when I read this. Hey, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. So you check what they tell you to do according to Scripture and then based on your conscience. It was Luther who convinced me as he stood, Martin Luther, uh, the, the great reformer. He stood before the popes and the councils and he was being judged and, and condemned. He said to go against conscience 
is neither right nor safe. For here I stand, I can do no other. His mind, his will were bound to what he saw in the word of God, regardless of what some of the church and governing authorities were saying. And every one of us will be held accountable by how we apply that. So yes, you better know the word of God and you better obey the laws that are given to you when they are in uh, connection with one another. But if you're going to step outside the bounds of the governing authorities, you better make sure that you know the higher authority has permitted you to step away from that. Because it will either help the gospel or hinder the gospel by how you respond. For those who submit to, uh, we, are we are to submit obediently, be submissive to the ruler's authorities and to be obedient. Why? Because our higher calling is to the gospel. This is how I think Jeremiah is helpful here. I, th I think when Jeremiah 29 verse 7 tells us, how do we as Christians who where this world is not our home, how do we respond? I like what he says here. Be, seek the welfare of the city. Do the things that are right for the, for the community where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare, you'll find your welfare. Well, let's move on. Not only do we submit obediently when that is right, we serve eagerly. Look at this, these words, to be ready for every good work. Be prepared for anything God puts for you. The word every there is very comprehensive. It reminds me of Galatians 6.10 that says, So then, when we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. How are you going to act outside the walls of the church when you're interacting with the community? The grace-starved people, you do good where you can. When you see a need, you try to meet it. Look to help others in, every, in any and every opportunity. Look at the rest of those words here. It says to speak evil of no one and to be gentle. Oh, Christians need to be called to account here. Because sometimes we, we get just as negative and as critical as the world does. I see what you post. I see how you, what you say to people sometimes. It says to speak evil of no one, to be gentle. There's a sweet reasonableness. Evil there is blaspheme. To speak evil is to blaspheme someone, to slander them, to treat them with contempt. Oh, what a shame it is to our gospel uh, testimony when we bring in this type of uh, evil speaking and, and, and contentment towards others. Christians are to be peaceable, gentle, considerate. Even give others the benefit of the doubt. Look at how we're, our primary calling is to share the gospel, but how other things begin to distract us and, and take us away from the effectiveness in our community when we merge it with things that are not right. He closes verse 2 with, to show perfect courtesy towards all people. People we disagree with. People who live differently than us. People who even live in sin. How can we show perfect courtesy towards all people? This, this showing is a demonstration of humility. It's a meekness towards people. Placing other people ahead of ourselves, as Jesus did, illustrated in Philippians chapter 2. Did not consider equality of God something to be grasped, but made himself a servant, a, a, a slave to, to those he was serving. We need the mind of Christ and the actions of Christ. Our great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission has to be more than just a strategy. It really has to be a surrendering to God's leadership. Believing the right things is only a start. Becoming like Christ is the goal if we're going to make an impact in this world. So we need to remember who we are and then he moves into, and it's, a, it's going backwards a little bit. If you see verse 3, he's going to now say, remember who you were. If that's how you are now, according to how Christ has transformed you, just pause and just remember where God took you from. Verse 3 says, for we ourselves were once foolish. It means stop being foolish now. You used to be foolish. You, you used to be disobedient. You used to be led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. The reason he's calling you to something higher is because he's now reminding you, that's who you were in your sinful state. But you must leave that sinful state if you're ever going to make an impact in the community and the world that you live in. If Christ is ever going to be glorified in your world, it's because you have to leave the former state. These things come naturally. 
These other things come supernaturally. We used to be deceived, it says, for we once were foolish. We, we believed things that were not true. We were senseless and ignorant and arrogant. We were deceived, being led astray, going in the wrong direction. You know, sin makes you stupid. And there's a tweetable comment. It does. When you far, start falling into sin, it, it makes you stupid. You're blinded to the things that are reality. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly or foolishness to him. They, they see it, but they don't see it. They live a way, oh, yeah, I can do all of these things, and no, there will be no consequences for any of the things that I do. That's the foolish thing to believe. How many people think, I can do all of these things and get away with it? Your sin will find you out. You're deceived. It says you're disobedient. Our natural bent is always to disobey and seek our own way. We've been disobedient to God since birth. We're disobedient to authorities, disobedient to parents, to employers, to laws, to anyone, because we are self-centered by nature and self-deceived. That's how we were in our sinful state. Remember that you were dominated. You were led astray as slaves to various passions and pleasures. This dominated by slaves thought here is a continuous state of slavery with passions and pleasures. You know, passions and pleasures are great for a season, but they never are satisfied. You know, those who, who start into chemical substances think, well, just a little here, just a little there, but I'll have control. Eventually, it's gripped somebody in such an intense way, they can't get out of it on their own because they're a slave to it. And it's never satisfied. Just a little leads to just a little bit more, to a little bit more dominated. Sin entices, luring you. But no matter how much you give in, it's never satisfied. It says this, we were despiteful, passing our days in malice and envy, contemptuous, intentionally harmful, an evil attitude. Malice is an evil attitude of mind which manifests itself in ill will and desire to injure. Envy is an unquenchable, unquenchable desire to have what you do not have. By definition, the envious person cannot be satisfied with what he has and will always crave more. You buy the latest whatever it is, and within weeks, that's an old item. And boy, I wish I had the newest item. And you know, this whole marketing, I think they've already discovered how to make the greatest thing in the world, but they're just going to lead you to continue to buy things till we get there. That's what it is. They just always... Uh, Seeking the envy of something else or someone else. And he concludes being despised, or we, we were despised. We hated by others and hating one another. Hateful is our natural attitude. And hating is our character and action. And this is who we were. In contrast, he tells us that we should be known. Jesus said, you should be known as my disciple by how you love one another. How do you love one another? How do you even love your enemies enough to pray for them and not condemn them? These are the ways that we interact. He's saying, this is who we were. This is who you should be now. Now I want you to look at verse 4 through 7. Remember when God's grace came to you. We were changed because God's grace came to us. I'm thankful as I'm reminded of who I have been and who I still struggle with sometimes in my own personality and, 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 and hang-ups. God's still doing a work in me. But remember when God's grace came to you. Look at verse 4. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done in our righteousness, but according to His own mercy. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out to us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Verse 7. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The Bible says we were spiritually dead. And then the precious words, but God. Spiritually dead, separated from him, nothing we can do. But God steps in. 
and changes it. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. Just a few thoughts here. First, God cares for us. You notice it's goodness and kindness appeared to us. Not because of our greatness. It wasn't our works. It wasn't our attraction. It wasn't something that God was going to benefit from. No, all benefit was from him towards us. And you notice in the book of Titus, you've been following along. This is the third appearing. One of the things you ought to do more often when you're reading through Scripture, especially an entire book as small as this one, is notice repetitive words. Appearance. You say, well, it appeared to us. This is the third time he's mentioned an appearance. In chapter uh, 2, he said, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. Later in chapter 2, he says, the glory of God appeared. It says, waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God. So his grace has appeared. The, we're waiting for the glory of God to, to appear as Jesus comes back. And then here, what has appeared? The goodness and loving kindness of God has appeared to us. I'm thankful for the appearance that he, he reveals his grace, his glory, and his goodness to, to undeserving people. Remember when God's grace came to you? It was because God cared for you even when you did not care for him. And then God doesn't just care for us. He changes us. Look at what he says here in verse 5. He saved us. It was his work of transformation in us. Not because of works we did. We love him because he first loved us. But it was because of his own mercy. He came and washed us of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Not because of us, but because of his mercy. He doesn't just come to us, he comes to change us. And then he comforts us in verse 7, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. There is comfort there. I have justified you. I will carry you along. You will become my heir the triune God has adopted us into his kingdom. That's the grace of God. It is signed, sealed, and it's settled if you trust him. So when you go out into a world, he needs to hear the gospel. Don't worry about what they say about you, what do they do to you. You are signed, sealed, and secured and settled in Christ. And you have all to bring to them. You're not seeking something that they would bring to you. The benefit is all for them if they would hear the gospel. Lastly, in verse 8, there's one more remembering. As he said, remind him of these things. He says, remind or remember why God still has you in this world. In verse 8, it says, Thus, or this saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things. So that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These are excellent and profitable for people. In the writing of these words, it's not just, I'll devote myself to work and I will profit from them. It's actually an external profit. The more you are dedicated to Christ, the more you, you live out his life, you will live an excellent life and everyone around you will profit. There ought to be neighbors of yours, doormates or hallmates of yours that say, I'm so glad they're here because they are such a light even if they don't know God, they're going, there's something about them that it is enjoyable. There, there's something precious about their presence. There's an aroma around them that is just unmatched. Are people profiting by your presence because you live out the glory of Christ through your life? Paul says this is what's going to happen in our world. God still has you on the planet so that you would live it out. And people would know him. They would see your good works, yet glorify your Father who is in heaven. You need to keep on believing in God. He says, I insist on these things. And then keep on benefiting others by doing what he's called you to do. I think this next year, what are ways you could benefit? There, there are places, I think, in our church that you could, you could benefit some other people, bless some other people. I mean, you could, you could uh, sing in the choir. You could teach a Sunday school class. You could you know, serve as a deacon. You could, you could help in all kinds of different ways in, inside this building. And those are good and right. But even more so, who is it in your world that needs the benefit of your presence? Uh, who is it that needs some tutoring? Who is it that just needs their lawn mowed? 
Who is it that, you know, you, you could just call and encourage that just needs that? That's not a program. That's not, a, oh, at 7 o'clock on a Thursday night here at the church, we're going to do this, and you can be a part of that. All those are fine and good, but you know what? There are hundreds, if not thousands, of opportunities a week where you can profit other people by the life that Christ is living in you. That's what Paul's calling them to. He didn't say, hey, we're going to have more, 14 more programs you can be a part of the church. I remember driving down to Atlanta uh, on 400, going north towards coming one time, and a billboard popped up about a church. He says, we've got 427 programs for your family. And I thought, how exhausting is that? Once, it's kind of like the Roach Motel. Once you check in, you'll never check out. You'll be there all the time. And the more the church gathers and keeps away from those who are grace-starved, the worse our world will be for it. We have to get together as a, as a body. We need the encouragement of one another. But if all we do is huddle down to encourage one another and we never go out and communicate the gospel and love that he's given us to others, we're not the church. We're just a country club encouraging each other until Jesus comes back. Paul says, don't do that. Do what Christ has called you to do. Be a believer and go out and live in the world where they need to see a genuine, authentic believer in Christ and love them, respect them, treat them with gentleness, but be open and honest about your great God who they need to know.